Hello from the Authors Guild Foundation. We're here for media training for authors with Paula Rizzo, in which we'll discuss producing videos, giving on-camera interviews, and much more. This webinar is part of our series, Business Boot Camps for Writers, which is funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and by Penguin Random House, so thank you to them. And I'd also like to thank two of our partner organizations we work with who help assemble these webinars. Uh, Broadleaf Writers Association, which provides craft courses and community for writers in Atlanta and the general region, and the Carnegie Center for Literacy and Learning in Lexington, Kentucky, which offers educational programs for writers of all ages and career stages. We have a large crowd here today. Thank you all so much for being here. I know this is a great topic uh, for authors. Um, please bear with me uh, with the Q&A box. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for Paula. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, you can leave uh, comments there. You can use that as a chat box as well. And there are closed captions available um, if you click on the live transcript option. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenter today, uh, Paula Rizzo. Um, Paula is an Emmy award-winning television producer and best-selling author of Listful Thinking and Listful Living. She's a media training coach, speaker, LinkedIn learning instructor, host of the live stream show Inside Scoop, and creator of the popular online training Media Ready Author. Uh, Paula, so today you're going to present, and in three weeks, we're going to reconvene for part two of this, uh, where some authors will come on to talk about their real-life experience touring and doing other kinds of interviews. But today, I know you have a lot to, uh, to teach us all, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here, and thank you all for showing up. If there's something to be said for showing up live, for sure, so I appreciate it. We have a lot to get through, and um, I'm excited to share what I know with you. You're getting a preview of my slides right there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so here we go. You are in the right place. Absolutely. Want you to be here. And I want you to know that we're going to cover a lot. Okay. Um, I talk pretty fast. I will do my best to slow it down because that's part of the training here is to not talk too fast when you're on camera. Here's what we're going to cover. How to produce compelling videos, setting up your virtual studio, and looking and sounding your best. Okay, this is all very important. We wanna make sure that we get through it all. And there will be time for Q&A, of course. How to produce compelling video. Okay, so this starts, many of you are authors or want to be authors or thinking about becoming authors. And so the best videos that you can produce have something to do with your book, right? Or your topic that you're an expert in. What is your niche? If you want to pop that into, I know we have a Q&A box. What is your niche? What are you uniquely qualified to talk about? What is it for you? And it's different for all of us, right? And you may be surprised at how many things you can actually talk about when you start thinking through this. And I want you to do this exercise, write it down on a piece of paper, put it in the chat box um, or in the Q&A box and uh, think it through because so often people will say like, I don't know what I would talk about in the media. I don't know how to talk about my book. I'm going to teach you. It is a specialized segment of the market for a particular kind of product or service, right? That's your niche. It is what you talk about. For me, I love list making. I'm a former television producer and I only use lists really to be able to keep myself organized. And that is why I've written two books about lists, Listful Thinking and Listful Living. I love lists. So I talk about them. That is always my way in, right? People think, oh, Paula, she, that's right. She's the list lady. She's the one who love, loves lists. Even my father-in-law still calls me the list lady. Uh, so you, you start to sort of build a following for this. Is this the only thing I talk about? No, absolutely not. I do a lot of media. I do a lot of presentations about things that don't have to do with lists like this right now, right? So a lot of you are, are putting in all of your, your stuff that you talk about, cybersecurity and urban fantasy, amazing, uh, family sagas, historical fiction. See, you have a lot of great things that you can talk about. We're going to talk about how you can turn those into videos, how you can turn that into media interviews. But here is the caveat, okay? You have to think beyond promotion. And I know this is hard because you want to sell books. I totally get it. As an author, I know I own the prize here, people. I know. Uh, but you have to be thinking bigger than your book. All right. What are you trying to change or improve? Now, this can change depending if you're fiction or nonfiction, and we'll talk about both. What are you on a mission to do? Okay. And then how is this helpful to others? Because so often just talking about your book is only helpful to you, right? <laughs> So you want to make sure that you're talking about things that will actually change someone's life. And you do have the power to do that. 
be of service, always have this in your head and think, can I be of service with what I'm talking about in my videos, in the media, when I'm giving interviews, when I'm doing a talk, when I have a, a signing, you want to be of service to the people who are there, whether or not they ever buy your book. And I know that's a sharp pain to hear, but it's the truth. Because when you go in from a place of service and when you go in with a place of like, hey, I just want to put this out there, it actually alleviates a lot of pressure. And I know a lot of you, because some of you wrote in earlier um, when you first signed up, are a little anxious about video, right? And you're like, yeah, I don't know if I really want to do this. I'm a little nervous. I'm introverted. So I'm going to give you a few examples of people who are just like you and who do struggle with this, but do it anyway, because they go in from a place of service and this will help you. This woman is someone who I had media trained, um, Brandy uh, Doming, who is uh, the vegan eight. She has a very successful Instagram account and she has this cookbook. And when I media trained her, she was terrified. She didn't want to do any video. And her publisher was like, we got to get her to do video. This is a great book. It's it, all vegan recipes with only eight uh, ingredients. And I said, what's, what's the issue here? What do you, what do you think? And she said, I just, I'm terrified. I just don't want to do it. I just, you know, so I said to her, listen, why'd you write the book? W what's the impetus behind this? And she said, well, at the time her husband had terrible gout and it was debilitating for the entire family. They had to cancel family vacations. They couldn't do things. It was awful. And she realized as someone who lived in Texas, that the diet that they were eating, a lot of beef, a lot of meat was not really helping his condition. And when she started to cook vegan recipes, he started to feel better. And I said to her, huh, that's so interesting. Wouldn't you have loved a year ago for somebody to have told you this exact same thing so that you could have gone to Disney World with your family or whatever it was that you were doing, right? She said, oh, of course, I wish someone would have told me. I said, this is you now. How dare you keep this to yourself? You have to talk about it. You can change someone's life. So that just flipped a switch and now she does video all the time. You should follow her. She's amazing. She does tons and tons of stuff. But see, it's that switch of how you can be of service. How can you be helpful that really will turn it and be able to make you say, hey, you know what? This is bigger than me. This is not just a book I wrote. This can actually change someone's life. So keep that in your mind. Okay, so what are your topics? Now, a lot of you have said the, the things that you talk about, astrology, memoir, right? So what topics, what kind of topics of, of, uh, uh, of a video could you produce, right? You know, like for me, I could talk a lot about a to-do list, how to create a to-do list, how not to create a to-do list. There's tons and tons of things that I can do. So think through for yourself now that you've identified your niche, what are some of the topics? And if you want to stick some of them in there, you can, um, and, and we can, we can just see this, um, you know, and this goes for fiction or nonfiction, right? Because as a fiction author, which I'm also in the middle of writing a fiction book, so I totally understand both sides of this. Um, you also have things beyond the book to talk about, right? You can talk to the writer community about writing books, about how to find time to do this. Like if I was going to do something about fiction, I would say, how do I carve out time? Because I talk about productivity. How do I carve out time to write a book? Uh, there are lots and lots of things that you can do. So I'm going to give you some examples now. And I, I realize I have some cookbook authors on here. They're just easy because I love food. So that's why I always gravitate towards them. But this works for anybody in any niche, okay? Um, this is a friend of mine who I had interviewed years and years ago when I was a television producer in New York City. Her name is Nikki Dinky, and she wrote a cookbook, several cookbooks, but the most recent one is called More Veggies, Please. And she does a video series, which I'm going to show you one clip from, called How Not to Cook. Okay. It's entertaining. She's a former actress, or she is an actress. And so it's very fun. But it's not always directly related to her book, right? So the video that I'm going to show you in a second has nothing to do with this book. This, the thing she talks about is not in this book. It doesn't matter. And that's what I want you to remember. Like you can disconnect these things. A lot of times when I speak in the media, I don't talk about the things that are in my book directly, but I'm talking about that topic and it's completely okay. And I think that's a missed opportunity for a lot of experts and a lot of writers. They think, oh no, I only want to talk about the things in the book. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter what they want you to talk about. As long as they identify you as the author of that book, you talk about what they want you to do. Uh, so this increases her authority and her exposure. I love watching these videos. It's really fun. So here, I'm going to just play this for you. It's about 45 seconds. It's a quick one. It's something she had on Instagram, and then she repurposed and put it on YouTube. Bring the water to a boil. Do you see any bubbles? There's literally no bubbles. Ah! 
this is a simmer. Still a simmer. Wait for it. Yes, yes, now that's a boil. Ah. Boop, 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 boop. Whenever you're ready. Oh, it's in my mouth. Oh, it's in my mouth. I'm proud of you. Ha! Oh my gosh, did you love it? I love her videos. And you know what? Whenever I go to boil water, I think of this video. And I always think, nope, not yet. Not yet. It's not actually boiling yet. This has stuck in my head and changed my life, I have to say. And you know why? Because the human brain remembers visual information a hundred times longer than text alone. And that in itself is reason for you to start doing video because people will remember you so much more. They'll remember your tips. They'll remember what you're talking about. It will be much, much better. Can you still type and write and do blogs? Absolutely. But adding a little bit of video does make you a bit more memorable. Timing here is the key. So that was about 40, I think it was about 47 seconds, right? So it was quick, but the truth is a minute is an eternity. You really can get a lot done in just one minute if you properly plan for sure. So obviously she thinks through this ahead of time. She knows exactly what she's going to shoot, you know, all of that. Um, video length depends on the platform. Okay. So right. Book talk, TikTok, super short. I'm going to show you one of those in a second. Um, you have to know your audience, right? How much do they want to see? You want to get to the point as fast as possible. Gone are the days of saying, Hey, well, I'm going to talk about this thing. You have to get right in and talk about it. If you have a video that's longer, that's totally fine. Uh, if it's five minutes or longer, there needs to be something being shown a step-by-step, -step, uh, an interview with somebody else, some kind of interaction to really warrant it being that long. Okay. So I host a show called Inside Scoop. I do it every week on LinkedIn and all different platforms. And I love it. It's super, super fun, but I interview somebody. So it's, it's like a visual podcast. It's about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And we go back and forth. They ask, que answer questions, ask questions. It warrants the time, right? You wouldn't want to do that, uh, you know, without a person. It's a bit too long, right? For just one person talking on camera. Do people do it? Sure. But I don't think it's the highest value um, for you. Okay. Next is an example of a fiction author. Uh, Aparna Verma is the, the author of many, many fiction books, uh, but this one, The Phoenix King, just came out. I think she actually uh, self-published it, and then it was traditionally published afterwards, which is very exciting. Uh, she uses a mix of on-camera, so her face on camera, and also book-only shots. The book, the, the videos that she does are typically about the book directly, okay? And that works for TikTok, right? Because on BookTok, people want to know what the next book they should read is, right? And so they're gonna look and they wanna know specifically about the book. That works. On Instagram, you know, uh, Bookstagram maybe, uh, people will be interested, but for a general audience, I think it's better to sort of, you know, use one of those other topics, not only about your book, because they don't expect to see it there. And the thing that she does really well is she mixes it up. She doesn't always speak. She's not always on camera. Uh, so for someone who's saying, I don't want to be on camera and I don't want to dance. Look, I don't want you to dance either. I, I can't with those videos, right? As a TV producer, I cringe inside when I see the dancing and the pointing. There are so many other ways to be creative. And uh, this is one that, that she's done that has gotten many, many views. Okay, so The Boy With Fire is obviously another book of hers. She has tons of great examples. So if you follow her on uh, TikTok, you can see how she does it. And these videos get shared, right? 92% of mobile video users share videos with others. I do it every single day. I'm sharing puppy videos and I'm sharing, you know, cooking, <laughs> cooking videos and things like that. Um, so here's what video does for you. It builds credibility. So you see, like now you think of Nikki Dinky and you're like, oh, the one who taught me how to boil water, literally taught me how to boil water. Right. So now I go to her and I'm always like, oh, I wonder what she thinks about this topic. I wonder what she thinks about that topic. You want to be that person. This creates an intimacy with the audience. It makes you likable. It makes you memorable right? You want all of those things because social video generates 12 times more shares than text and images combined. This is important. 
So, you know, you want people to share what you're doing, to know about your book, to know about you as an expert, um, and to also, you know, make sure that what you're doing is, is hitting with people, right? You're going to do a lot of videos, honestly, that maybe no one will watch. That's totally fine. Don't feel like that's a failure. It's not, right? You, I can't tell you how many times I've done videos. I put things out there and I'm like, well, I, I really thought people would like that one. Guess not. You just keep doing it. You keep putting it out there. These videos are so short. They live such a short amount of time that just keep building at it. The types of videos you can do. This is important okay. too, because, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um. I'm so sorry. There's an, an alarm happening here. It, it's pretty quiet for us. Okay, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm yeah. so sorry. You know, you never know. This is another thing about doing live video. You just never know what's going to happen when it's going to happen. So the types of videos you can do are demonstration or tutorials, short tips to camera, an interview with another person. We talked about that, right? Spontaneous advice and insights. Okay. You're walking through, uh, you know, a bookstore, you see something, you want to do a quick video on it, you know, start thinking in terms like a, like a journalist, what could you talk about? What are the things that you, uh, spark your interest that you think people might be into? And then of course, media interviews, media interviews are a big one. I'm going to talk about that. And also, you know, when things go wrong like that, you know, obviously I, in I, media train people one-on-one -on -one, and I help them to think about what, what would happen if something like that went wrong. You know, if, if you're doing a media interview, you have to be prepared, you have to be ready. So I do have a few questions for you since I'm not going to be able to get through all of it, but if you go to paularizzo.com slash 10 Q, these are the 10 questions that any author needs to be able to answer in the media on stage or at a book signing, anywhere else, right? So if you go there, paularizzo.com slash 10Q, um, you'll grab that and I'll be able to, to send them to you because this is the crux of media training for me, right? Any person, that, any author specifically that I media train, I go through these 10 questions with them. So there's some for fiction and some for nonfiction. It's a little bit different, not, not completely different, but it's really helpful to, to think through what your answers would be. Because so often people say like, oh, you know what? I'll do media when my book comes out. And I always say, you know what? It's too late. You have to be doing media before the book comes out. And I know some of you are like, wait, what? What should I be talking about? All the things that we're talking about right now. I did media for years before I had a book. Okay. So I'm an Emmy award winning, uh, author, you know, so I have been doing a lot of media for a long, long time. And when my, before my first book listful thinking came out, I was already doing media as an expert in productivity and list making. All right. So then the reason why is because when you start doing that TV producers, editors, freelancers start to get to know you. So when your book comes out, they're much more inclined to bring you on, right? This is a, a TV hit that I just did uh, not that long ago for Pix11 in New York. And now I do a regular segment with them almost every month. Uh, I pitch them ideas. You know, how not to procrastinate is not in either of my books, really. I mean, maybe I do say the word procrastination or I talk about it a little bit here or there, but I'm pitching them ideas that are relevant now, right? This was a timely topic. So uh, I know people had questions of like, how do you find media outlets to, to, uh, to pitch? The truth is, what are you reading? What are you looking at? You have to watch TV. You have to, to go through and listen to podcasts. Podcasts are probably the easiest at the beginning because it's a good way for you to sort of hone your message, learn about what you're going to say, what your sound bites are going to be, what your talking points will be. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's a good way to really start practicing because when you're on TV, you don't have a lot of time, right? You have a very short window to get through what you want to say. So you want to watch, make sure that you know who is watching the show. This was a four o'clock show. So this is, you know, there's a lot of women watching at that time. I know that because I watch the commercials and you know that the commercials are targeted towards the audience. Those advertisers are not dummies. They know exactly who's watching. So when you watch, uh, same thing in a magazine, you see, you know, who, who the advertisers are. And then that way you're able to pitch better. I'm sorry, I'm going to pause for one second. 
Okay. So, uh, like I said, I did tons of media before I even had a book and you can do the exact same thing. You can start pitching yourself, uh, you know, reading and looking not only as a contributor, so not as someone who is writing the articles, but someone who is actually, you know, uh, commenting. You want to be the, the, the commenter because you know why? Media begets media. And it's amazing because even as a TV producer for years, what would I do? I would look at other media to find experts, to find, you know, authors. Honestly, I would go to Barnes and Noble or I would go to Amazon and I would say, who has a book coming out about this topic? So that's great. But you also want to be in other places in the media. Okay. So you want to be able to, to do that. One of the things that if you're going to do TV media specifically, you need to set up your virtual studio. You need to be ready. Part of the reason why I do so many TV hits is because I'm always ready, right? If they called me and said, hey, could you do this tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. I know what I'm going to wear. I know you know, how I'm going to do my makeup, which I'll talk about. Um, and I'm going to make sure that my studio, because now this is our home, looks really good, okay? So in the beginning of the pandemic, we all were in triage mode, right? Uh, it was fine, whatever you had. But now I want you to elevate what you're doing a little bit more, okay? So I, uh, this is a, I'm a LinkedIn learning instructor as well. And I have a bunch of courses about remote work and productivity and how to be more productive when you're working from home, uh, when you're working in a hybrid environment and all of that. So during the pandemic, I couldn't go to the studios for LinkedIn we had to shoot the videos ourselves in our apartment. So we, me and my husband, he, thankfully he has a TV background too, so he was able to help me, but they sent us all the equipment and we had to turn our apartment, this is our apartment in New York City, into a studio basically. And it's important to be able to do that no matter where you are. Obviously I'm in a different environment now and I've staged this environment to be a studio set up as well. So you need to be able to be flexible and learn how to do this so that no matter where you are, what you're doing, you have a consistently great looking video. All right, and I'm gonna teach you how to do it. So the do's and don'ts, always use natural light. I know that people get hung up about lighting and you think, oh, I need the perfect lighting. I need this. I need that. Look, don't go out and buy fancy stuff. I'm telling you right now, if you're just starting with video, just start with natural light. A window is the best possible light you can ever get. And then you'll pull in some lamps and some lights. Like right now, I'm not using professional lights in here. I have a window right in front of me and I brought in a couple of lamps to sort of fill in the spaces so that my face is lit evenly. That is all you need to do. Think about it. If you're in a hotel room and Good Morning America calls you and they're like, hey, we want to do a remote interview with you, you need to figure it out, right? You're not going to buy lights and do all these things. You're going to do the best you can possibly do. Always shoot eye level. So do you see how my eyes are directly eye level with the camera? You always want that. So what you should do is, and this is, of course, if you're using you know, an external camera or a, a camera on your, on your computer, you should boost it up. Okay, too often people have their computers way too low and I can see their ceiling. If I see your ceiling or I see your ceiling fan, it, your camera is not high enough, all right? Uh, so you need to boost it up with books, put books under there or a computer stand. I have a computer stand that I bought on Amazon for like 20 bucks and I use it all consistently. It's terrific. Look directly into the camera. Now, I cannot yell this enough. You need to look directly in the camera when you're addressing somebody. Okay. And the reason is, is because you have to have an intimacy with that person. The second that you break your eye contact, you've lost my interest as a viewer. And I am like, oh, she's just looking at herself in, in the phone. I see. She doesn't really care. She just wants to see what her eyelashes look like, or he wants to see what his hair looks like. So you do need to be focused. I get it. It takes time. It is not natural to talk directly to a camera. But when you do it, it really helps. And part of this too is, you know, look, we're on Zoom all the time, right? We're doing this a lot. Seeing yourself is not great. So anytime you want to hide your view, you can do like, you know, hide self mode. It does make you less self-conscious because then you're just focusing on the viewer and the person. Don't shoot with a window at your back. Okay. You never want to have light coming from behind you because it's going to make you too dark. You don't want that. Don't move the camera around. I mean, unless that's part of the video, right? Unless that's part of the charm of something fun or you're walking. But some of these walking videos just make me seasick. So, you know, do it strategically, uh, you know, because you don't want to be shooting up your nose. You want it to look nice. 
And don't be afraid to move the camera back. So often people shoot very, very close. And I get it, you know, when you're shooting vertical video, it, it's, you know, you want to have your, your camera a certain, certain way, but don't be afraid to pull back a little bit, you know, and show more of yourself. It doesn't have to be right in your face the whole time. And I think that'll take some pressure off people who are nervous as well, because, you know, you think that, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're saying too much, you know, it's too close. These cameras are too good these days. Right. So it's okay. You can pull it back a little bit. Right. Um, somebody has a question about, you know, do you talk to the camera while reading a script for a class? So I don't usually read scripts. Um, and I do that on purpose because I want to come off the way that I come off. Right. So be able to have bullet points in my mind. If you're doing media, you don't want to come off canned and scripted. Uh, I do use a teleprompter when I'm doing like my LinkedIn learning courses. Of course, I have a teleprompter prompter for that. But for my everyday videos, I think it's a crutch for people, unless you're really um, very good at reading off the teleprompter. And it is a difficult, uh, it's a difficult skill to master. Unless you're very good at it, it'll be a crutch and you will sound like a robot. And we don't want that. We want your personality to come through. What's behind you? So think about the things that are behind you when you're shooting that way. Uh, you know, so often we're like, okay, just shove all these boxes over in the corner because I don't want anybody to see that. That is the beauty of having your own setup here, right? But you want to have some depth. So what I mean is you want some space between you and the wall. You can't always do this, right? So you saw the shot of me in, in uh, for LinkedIn. What we did basically was put me in the middle of my living room because it's the only place that I could get depth like that. You, you're not going to do that for every video, right? It's not going to be what you're not going to rearrange all your furniture. So you have to do the very best that you can. And there are some times that you can't do it, right? You're going to be very close to, uh, to the wall, but just see if there's something that you can do, add in some objects behind you, you know, what's visible. Is there a plant? Anytime you can put, I have a little plant in here. I don't know if you can see them, but like anytime you can put something uh, living behind you, it just warms up the space and makes it look better. I'll show you some examples in a minute. And a green screen. Look, the beginning of the pandemic, people were really excited about the virtual backgrounds and how fun it was to look like you were on Mars or blur out your background. I can't stand these backgrounds. They look fake. Your hands disappear. It doesn't look polished or professional. So I would say lose the virtual background unless you have a green screen. Because if you have a green screen, it's going to look beautiful every single time. It is designed to do that. So I would say if you're using that virtual background, instead of, you know, blurring yourself out, really make the back of, uh, you know, wherever you are work if you can. And I realize this is not always going to be the case, but uh, do the best that you possibly can. All right. Equipment. I know there's a lot of questions about equipment. Here's what I would spend money on, right? So I wouldn't spend money on lighting right away. I would spend money on a camera. Um, I love the Logitech camera. That's what I use the external camera. It's under a hundred bucks. I put it on top of my, my computer. I don't think that the computer camera is that good. Uh, I do think that Mac needs to up their game on it. It's gotten better for sure, but it's still not great. So I use the external camera. And what I do is if I'm on a zoom call, I make, you know, the, the, the faces of people really small and I stick it up underneath that camera so that if I do need to look at the person and break eye contact with the camera, I'm just cheating a tiny bit. You know, I don't have to look all the way down at them. I can just see them right there. And I, I reserve the right to only look at them when they're speaking. So when I'm speaking, I keep contact with that camera. For lighting, look, you might get some lights, but I would say first off, just try the natural light. Try to bring in whatever light you have before you get crazy. A tripod. So the other thing is that for a camera, you know, iPhone is fantastic. You don't need to buy a crazy, you know, expensive camera for doing these videos. You can definitely use your iPhone, um, but make sure you have a tripod. You want to test out the tripod. Some people are really good at holding it. And so, you know, sometimes the videos warrant that and you want it to, to look that way but not always. The computer stand, as I mentioned, is very helpful to boost up the, the, uh, the computer and, and make sure that you're looking eye level. Headphones. Okay, so headphones, I have a love-hate with headphones because I don't love the way that they look on camera if you are presenting, but it is helpful for when you are listening, you know, if you're doing a, a call with somebody so that you can hear. There are ways to hide the headphones, of course. You know, you can have the little buds, the, the little ones that are wireless, or if you do have wired ones, what you can do is stick them behind your head and then like thread them back behind your, your, your head and put them in backwards, basically. So you're not, they're not hanging in front of you. They're hanging behind you. That is a, a, a radio host trick. They do that for when they're on camera sometimes. Um, so you want to make sure that you, you have that. And then the microphone, look, 
10 out of 10, you need a microphone. And that is why I have this one here. It sounds so much better. Thankfully, hopefully you didn't hear all the commotion behind me when I was freaking out because the cam, this is good enough, right? This is a very, very good microphone. Uh, it is a Audio Technica is the, is the company. I have bought this microphone many, many times. I've given it as gifts. It's under a hundred bucks. It works great. What I also do is I buy this little um, windscreen to put on top too, which helps because then you won't pop your peas, uh, which is a very annoying sound to have to listen to. So you want to, you know, I think this was like a dollar. So it's, it's very inexpensive, but it does make a huge difference, especially if you're going to do podcasts because you want to sound really crisp and clear and you can plug this right into your computer. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about looking and sounding your best. So this is some media training 101. I'm gonna take a, a look here to see, there's a lot going on in this uh, Q and A here. Yeah, the Apple iPods, uh, yes, I like those. This mic is the Audio Technica and they have many different ones. For lighting, what about a ring light? Uh, yeah, I mean, I like the ring light, it's okay. You know, the thing I don't love about the ring light is that it you can see it in the person's eyes you know you see that little ring light it just doesn't look great it's a bit unnatural but look it works if you want to pop it up onto your onto your desk and you have it and it makes your setup easy then go for it um just a quick note if you wear glasses because i get this question a lot uh how do you eliminate glare well the the glasses are going to reflect what it sees so if you have the light right in front of you, it's going to reflect the light. So if you don't want to see that light, you just have to bump up the light higher than your glasses. Okay, so the light will be a little bit higher up than than eye level. And that way you can eliminate some of that glare because that is a I get it. It doesn't look great. Right. Okay, so let's get into this. What I'm going to teach you works for all kinds of media. Okay. So if you're doing your own videos, if you're on a podcast, if you're being interviewed for a magazine, if you're on TV, if you're at a book signing, uh, if you're on stage talking about your book or whatever it is, this will definitely help you to do it in a, in a better way. Okay. Where do I look? I mentioned it already. Have to look in that camera. Absolutely. If you're in person with somebody, here's a trick that I used as a TV producer. Whenever I would interview someone and talk to them, you know, I'm hearing what they had to talk about, uh, I would pick one eye to look in. Because so often when you're talking to somebody, you're like, should I look at their forehead? Should I look at their mouth? Should I look at their nose? Should I switch looking in between this eye and that eye? No, pick one eye and just stare in it the whole time. And it eliminates the anxiety of not knowing where to look. You seem engaged, you're talking with them, you're connecting, and you don't have to worry about that. You can just worry about talking. And this helps with media interviews as well. So try it today. The next time you talk to somebody in person, just look in one eye and maintain that eye contact. Uh, it really, really helps. It really works. How do I sit? All right. So for media interviews or even videos like this, like I'm at the edge of my seat right now. And that is how you should always be feet on the floor, edge of your seat, poised to speak about what you know, right? You don't want to be too relaxed. You don't want to be laying down unless that's your thing, right? Unless that's like your personality and it's a funny thing that you're doing with the video, then go for it. But for the most part, if you're doing something where you're presenting about a book, you're on a panel talking about your book, you want to be poised. You don't want to be too relaxed, okay? You can cross your legs or not, um, but just really be engaged. I would say that's the word, right? Engaged. You don't want to be like using the furniture too much. How do you keep your energy up? This is super important. And this is when I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, it's something that really, really, um, it needs to be practiced, it's not something that comes natural. So if you're doing something like this, like presenting the way that I'm doing this now or being interviewed, what I would say is to fill the room with the sound of your voice. It doesn't feel natural at first. And you might feel like, oh gosh, am I gonna be like a used car salesman? This is a little bit, you know, no. The camera does pull away and strip some of your energy. So you do need to sort of bump it up a little bit more. But the best way that I can explain it is to really Fill the room with the sound of your voice and it will allow you to keep your energy up. I'm naturally very bubbly and this is how I am in person, but I do this for the camera too. Like I make sure to maintain this level throughout the whole time that we're together because you know what? It makes it a better experience for you and it's actually more fun for me. But so often what happens is that if you're in a studio with someone and let's say that the anchor or, you know, whoever's introducing you or speaking to you has low energy, you're going to feed off of that. 
and then you're going to have low energy. And then you know what? That's not going to be a great media hit for you because you're going to look like you have no energy. So you have to make sure you have how to bring your own energy. You can't show up and just, you know, just, oh, well, they're kind of quiet. So I guess I'll be kind of quiet. You have to be yourself, but you also have to get your message across in a, in a way that is memorable. You want to make sure that people uh, know, know that it's you, right? And that you, they, you keep their energy. Um, standing for Zoom interviews helps with energy. That's what Karen says. True. Definitely. Absolutely. If you find that when you stand, it's better, then do it. I love that tip. Okay. What do I wear? Huge question, right? You always want to be comfortable. You don't want to be testing out a new outfit or whatever. Uh, you want to look neat and professional. I always choose bold colors. Anytime I'm on, on camera, um, I love the jewel tones. It looks really nice on, on most people. So you want to do that and uh, bring a backup. So this is if you're in the studio, let's say, you might want to bring a backup. You never know, something spills on you or you're wearing the same outfit as the anchor. This has happened before, not with me, but when I was a producer, someone did show up in the exact same thing as our anchor. And we were like, oh gosh, good thing we have hair and makeup here. We will just make sure that the anchor switches their outfit since the guest didn't have another outfit with her. Um, but you never know, that could happen. I would stray from patterns or logos, unless that's part of the video, right? Unless, you know, you have a logo that says something that, that has something to do with it. Otherwise, I would not have a logo. No patterns. Patterns look weird on camera. You know, they kind of shimmer and shake. Uh, so you definitely don't, don't want to do that. I, I would say no black and no white. And the reason I say that is because black and white are very hard to light, to light well. Okay. Especially if, you know, like I have dark hair, so I wouldn't wear black because it just blends in. I just, you know, you can't see anything. So um, if you're on set, you will sometimes see an anchor wear black or wear white. It's because they have a professional lighting crew to make sure they look fabulous. Okay. If you go on the show, you're going to get the guest lighting, which will be like really quick and changes all the time. So I would just avoid it. All right. Uh, that's what I would say. Nothing too sheer or too flimsy uh, if for obvious reasons, right? You don't want, unless it's your thing, you know, and, and, and that's part of, part of the, the book or part of the appeal. But what I would say is uh, always be mindful of where you're going to be microphoned, okay? If you're in a studio or you're on a panel or if you're doing a reading or something like that, think about it. Uh, if you're in a, for, you know, if you're in a dress, where do you put that mic pack? Maybe you hold it, maybe not. Maybe like this shirt that I'm wearing now, it's a little flimsy. So I probably would not wear this if I was in a studio on television because I know that they would put the microphone here and it would just, it wouldn't stand up. It wouldn't hold the microphone and it would look messy. So you just want to think through these things ahead of time. And I'd also say no chunky jewelry, nothing that's going to be, you know, making noise, no bracelets that are clanging around, no bra no, no, you know, necklaces that are going to hit into your microphone and no hats. I get it. I media trained a whole bunch of cryptocurrency experts and they all wanted to wear their hats on camera. Um, and I said, look, no one can see your face. So it's a no from me. Right. Uh, but it, look, if, if it's part of your stick, it's part of your look, you can make it work. But as a general rule, I would say uh, to avoid hair and makeup. This is a big one. Okay. So when I was doing the LinkedIn learning courses, I have seven of them and six of them I produced at home. Only one was I able to go into the studio for once the pandemic lifted. Um, and so I went to a friend of mine who had done makeup for, you know, many, many years in TV news. And I said, you've got to teach me how to do my hair and makeup at home. Cause I, I don't know what I'm doing if I'm doing these videos. And she gave me such great advice. She said, you know, you obviously are going to wear more makeup than you think you need. And this goes for men and women. Um, men should definitely be wearing some powder because you're under lights. You don't want to look shiny. Um, and it, she said, you're always going to wear a little bit more than you think, right? So your, your camera makeup is not the same as your everyday makeup. All right. So just first of all, get that into your into your mind that it's going to look different. It might not be the way that you would do your makeup if you're you know going out to dinner or something like that. The other tip that she gave me was to line your eyes to make sure that you put some, uh, I guess it, I guess you could put eyeliner or powder underneath and frame your eyes. And that way it really helps you to pop on camera. She's like, if you do nothing else, those two things will really, really help. And you have to practice. You have to, you know, look and feel comfortable. You don't want to be wearing a ton of makeup if you don't usually, but you definitely need to wear some on camera so that it looks good. Now, 
not always if you're in a studio or doing a TV interview or, you know, you're doing your book signing, will they provide hair and makeup? That doesn't always happen. Sometimes it does, which is nice. Um, but you should anticipate it not happening and showing up with makeup uh, or hiring somebody. You can hire a professional makeup artist. Glam Squad is terrific. And in most cities now, I've used them quite a lot when I've done, you know, videos on my own. Uh, during the pandemic, I did my own makeup and I became, you know, very comfortable doing it. But you want to make sure that uh, you do feel comfortable because that'll be one thing that's that's off your your mind. Now, how do you show your book in the shot? Well, I showed you some videos where the book was definitely prominent, right? That was the the TikTok video. She's showing a book. There's a lot of you know opportunities to show the book that way. But what if you're doing a media interview or what if you're doing your own video? How do you show it? And I work with a lot of publishers who are very concerned when they hire me uh, to media train their authors. They're very, very um, concerned about if the book is going to be shown. And make sure to get the book in the shot. And as a TV producer, I know that that is not the first thing that media cares about. You know, the media is not there to sell your book. They really are not. And they just want a good story that's going to be of service to their audience. So for me, this is a, a TV hit that I did uh, some years ago for my second book, Listful Living, with Ernie Anastas. If any of you are New Yorkers, you will know Ernie. He's a legend in New York. So it was very thrilling to be able to do that. But do you see at the top there, they identified me as the author of Listful Living. Terrific. It almost doesn't matter if you see the book or not. You know what I mean? I'm able to at least have have that there. Uh, but sometimes they do show it. Sometimes in the beginning they will show, you know, the book cover and all of that. They don't always. So you you don't want to, you always want to bring the book with you if you're in studio or you're going to to some event or a panel, bring books with you. You'd be surprised how many times people do not have them when they're supposed to have them. Always bring the book. And if you're doing something uh, at home, how can you place the book best? Okay, so this is Room Raider. Uh, if, if you're on Twitter, it's fantastic. I love this account because it, all they do is rate rooms uh, of people doing media interviews. So this woman, uh, you know, she was not identified as the author of the book, but she did stick it in the background. Mm, it's, you know, this is a, a B, B effort, you know, B plus effort. She's got the book back there, but I can't really see it, right? So it's good, but could it be better? I love that she has the plant in the background. Uh, that that looks good. Now, this guy, if you, you know, watch any kind of cable news, he's constantly on. And he always has his book right there. And do you see how how great the placement is of that book? You can read it. You can see it. It's not distracting. Uh, that is an A++. That is the best way to do it. You know, I have my books here in the background. They're a little far away, I'd have to say. You know, they're not close. Sometimes you can, you can uh, make it work and sometimes you can't, right? So what do I say? Now, this is, this is very important, right? You want to make sure that you tell stories. If you're, if you're giving examples, like you're a nonfiction author, you're giving examples of things, tell stories because people remember stories. If you're a fiction author, you know, you want to talk about something that happens in the book, but you want to be succinct about it. And here's the caveat. You want to tell the story as if it's the first time you've ever told it. Now, this is a man who uh, is near to near to my heart. His name is Mo Gaudet, and he's the, he was the former, he is the former chief business officer at Google X, and he's also the author of Solve for Happy. He is an engineer, and he came up with an algorithm, algorithm for happiness, because of course, if you are an engineer, that is what you would think to do. And I, I interviewed him many, many years ago when I was in TV news, and uh, afterwards, I said, you know, the story that you told, the reason that you wrote the book... What is that story? And, you know, he tells me the story again. And what happened was tragically his son died, his appendix burst and he died and it should not have happened. It was a freak thing. And so he went on this quest to then find happiness afterwards. I mean, it's the whole crux of why he started this. And I said, you know, when you told the story, I felt nothing. I felt like you told me that you just had oatmeal for breakfast. There was nothing to it. It was just very matter of fact. And like, there was no emotion. He said, oh, it's just that I've told the story so many times. I said, yes, but I never heard it. My audience never heard it. This was a missed opportunity. So from that day on, he started telling the story as if no one had ever heard it. So I tell you this so that you remember that just because you've told the same stories and you talked about the same things over and over again, 
your audience has not yet heard it. So you do have to show up and make sure that you're like a Broadway actor in a way, right? Just because you did the matinee doesn't mean you can mail it in when you're doing the night show, right? You really have to make sure to keep that going and keep people interested. So you'll remember Mo now when, when you're telling stories multiple times. So the way that you can talk into in, in sound bites, because that's very important, you know, if you have a short amount of time to get things through, is to know your talking points. So you're going to prepare ahead of time. What are the three things you definitely want to get across when you're doing this interview? You want to be decisive and stake your claim. What I mean by this is never say, well, you know, what I think is, uh, -uh. all that is just filler. Just get to the point. Just say it. List changed my life. They're the most amazing thing ever. That's pretty decisive, right? You want to get in there and say what you know. Always give value, but be brief. You don't want to go on and on unless the time warrants it. And that is why this is what I teach all of my, my clients. Um, and I, I talk about it in, in uh, my online course, Media Ready Author, is to use the accordion method. So this is a method that I designed so that you can have a short, medium, or long answer to anything that you're asked right? You want to be able to have a headline, think in headlines. If you have a short amount of time, you want to answer it really succinctly and fast. If you have more time, okay, I can give a little bit of an example. And if you have even more time, okay, I'll finish out the thought. But you want to be able to really pack a punch in the first few words because that's what people remember. And also that's all you might have time to do, right? You might get cut off. You might be on a panel. Somebody else might jump in. You just really never know what might happen, right? So this is a woman who is in my Media Ready Author class, and uh, she is a fiction author. And so she, I've taught her the accordion method. She started doing it for, her book just came out in January. She started doing it for her book. And she's like, you know what? It really has changed the game for me to think in headlines about what are the first few words that I'm going to say first. And see, it works for fiction. It works for nonfiction. It works for any discussion that you have, right? If you're doing a, a, a Zoom call, it really helps you to think, what are the first few things that I want to get across that I want to make sure that people really hear? Think like a reporter. What, if you hear nothing else, will this be of value? So think of that when you're giving answers, when you're, when you're doing your, um, when you're doing your prep work, a lot of times we put that information at the end, that big, you know, idea right at the end. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you really, um, put it right up front. And I, I talk about this a lot, uh, in, in the, uh, paularizzo.com slash 10 Q, which is the 10 questions that any author needs to know how to answer. So the questions will be there. And then underneath, I go through exactly what the accordion method is and exactly how to prep for any question that you're asked. And of course, one of the biggest questions is always, what's your book about? And I get it because, you know, as someone who's now writing fiction, people ask me all the time and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know yet. I haven't worked it out. I'm not there yet. So I totally, totally empathize with you. Um, so yeah, if you go to paularizzo.com slash 10Q, you can grab that. Um, and also I have, uh, we're going to take some q and I know there's a lot. The Q&A box has been going crazy here. Um, so if there are questions that you have, stick them in there now because we're going to take some questions. Um, but the other thing that I have is a, it's a limited offer, but if anybody is interested, I would love to be able to help you with your own media strategy um, for a one-on-one -on -one free media strategy session. If you go to speakwithpaula.com, you can apply. There are limited spots, um, but if you are eligible, I'll be sure to be in touch with you about that. Uh, and then what we do really is figure out where you are, where you'd like to be, and then how to go from there. And like I said, you know, I work with people who are both already have a book are thinking about having a book uh, or the book is is already out. And it's interesting because a lot of times people think, oh, the publisher will help me so much. Yes, the publisher will help, but then what happens when the book is not new anymore? How will you sustain the book and continue to keep it out there in the world? That is a very interesting uh, task and one that I have been able to do. So my book, my first book, Listful Thinking, came out eight years ago. And I was just on TV talking about book like lists and book this book like last week so you can continually talk about your topics and your things uh but it, you do need to have a strategy around it so i'd be happy to help if you go to uh, speakwithpaula.com for that and of course you know the the freebie is, is still on the table for you if we take some some questions all right thank you so much paula of course um, gosh it's a lot it's a lot this is great it is a lot. um 
so you know we have writers from all genres here um and different comfort levels with all of this uh could you speak a little to just approaching interviewers because that's that's one thing a lot of people want to hear more about yes absolutely so you do want to uh you know a lot of times people say oh you have to have a publicist to be able to you know, get any kind of media interview. It's not true. You know, I mean, yes, does it help, especially when you have a book launch because the book is new. So it's sort of like the occasion for why you would reach out. Um, but you just want to be, again, how can I be of service? How can I think about what I'm talking about to be able to help other people and really targeting where the audience lives. Okay. So what I mean by that is, do you want to do magazines? Do you want to do uh, podcasts, TV specifically? Which ones? Make a list of those. I can't help myself. You've got to make a list. Make a list of those and then start reading what they write. Start watching the show. Start seeing who do they book? What kinds of people are out there? And then one by one, pick one and start writing a pitch. And the pitch is never, oh, read my book, right? It's what can you, like, I just did a pitch, um, you know, it was the, the how to be, um, how to procrastinate less in 2023. Could I have pitched that? At any time in the year, 100%. That is a very evergreen topic. That is not something that's new, right? But I pitched it for the beginning of the year because I thought, oh, this is, this is a, a good occasion. So you always want to think of like, what, what kind of timely news hook can you, can you pitch? And then I, I, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's on online now. That's not the way that it used to be, but there's a lot of stuff that you can find online on the websites for these different publications so that you can find who to pitch. Because the truth of the matter is, Producers and editors want your pitch. They need new stuff. So they want to hear from you. They want to be found. It's not like the old days where they were sort of hiding. Uh, I also find LinkedIn to be a really great way to do this. When I was a TV producer, I loved LinkedIn because I was able to then connect with whoever interviewed me because then they would move away and go somewhere else. And I wanted to be connected with them if I didn't have their email address anymore. So it's a good practice to start looking on LinkedIn, see you know what reporters and, and people are, are there and connect with them. But also it's great because then they also watch you. And this has happened to me multiple times where I will post something, like I posted something about, I think it was like clutter and stress and how, you know, if, if you're, if, if you have clutter around you, you're really stressed out. I had wrote that, wrote that article, I think in 2017. And I just put it up again because I was like, no, this is good. An anchor uh, reached out to me and said, hey, we love this idea. Could you come on and talk about it? Okay, for me, it wasn't new, but for them, it was new. So you just never know who's watching. Mm -hmm. um, any special tips for fiction and, and poets? Um, or... Should they, does that same logic apply if you just find outlets that are interviewing? Yeah, I mean, you're going to find, yeah, I think you're going to find uh, different, you know, maybe trade publications. It's going to be different, right? You're not going to talk about certain things in, in major mainstream media. It just does, it's not the place for it. But you can think about uh, topics that will work, uh, you know, and, and even on, I'm thinking about TikTok, specifically for poetry. There's a woman, and her name is escaping me right now, but she literally reads her poetry on TikTok. She doesn't show her face. She has her book. She has a, a, a shot of the book and she reads through it. And that's how she, she does her videos on TikTok, which is brilliant. And she has tons and tons and tons of followers. For fiction, you really want to be thinking of, you know, how is this a, a wider message? Uh, you know, you could be talking about if your poetry, like creativity and how creativity helps you to, you know, be less stressed, let's just say, right? That's a nonfiction topic that you as a poet can talk about because you personally feel the benefits of being creative and writing poetry. I don't know. I just made that up. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, you have to be thinking about how can I sort of take what I know and be able to do this? There's a lot of really great, uh, you know, fiction authors out there who do a lot of media. Jodi Picoult comes to mind. Like, she does tons because her books are timely, right? She had done one about a school shooting one time. And then she talked about the trend of school shootings and how her book was related to that and why she decided to write about that. Okay, I get it. Like, she's a amazingly, uh, you know, very, very famous uh, person who is very successful at this. But we have to look to these examples because she had to start somewhere, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, people are wondering uh, tips for like what kinds of videos perform the best, uh, the length of the video. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you have, do you have tips on that front? Yeah, I mean, it does depend on the, the outlet, or like where you're going to put it, the platform. Um, but for sure, I would say the shorter, the better. So you want to do like 
a minute or less, uh, and especially for TikTok, like way less than that. Um, but also you want to pack a punch in the beginning. It's the same thing like I was talking about for, for um, sound bites. You want to get to the point early so that people know exactly what this is about. You know yourself, you're looking through your Instagram or your whatever, and it's like, if it doesn't catch your attention in two seconds, you're done. And the attention span, I don't even know what the attention span is now. It's definitely way worse than it ever has been in, in, in the history of, of people. Um, so you want to get to the point very, very quickly. Uh, I just want to add, if anyone hasn't downloaded TikTok or looked at Instagram Reels to do so, and I think I'll, it, it sheds a lot of light on it right away. You, you start to see what's going on um, and you just put in a few book related hashtags and you'll see what other people are doing. Um, yeah, yeah. Good point. Uh, yes. You have to see <clears throat> what they're doing. And you, And to be clear, you can edit the video in the app pretty easily. Um, you know, there's a learning curve, but, uh, did you have, a? Uh, a lot of people wanted to know the actual model numbers or of your camera and mic. Do you have ah, any of those? I do not have those, but if you do, if you sign up at paulavrizzo.com slash 10Q, I'll make sure to write it to you, uh, cause then I'll have your, your information, but, uh, it's a, uh, I use the Logitech camera. And this is an audio technica, but I don't know what the, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, follow up with that information, but I find these to be, you know, they're both under hundred bucks. Um, it almost doesn't matter uh, what you use. You have to kind of test it out and see what works for you. But I found these to consistently be the best for the longest amount of time and be very, very affordable. You know, sometimes people will spend all this money on a microphone or all this money on a camera and nah, they're not that great. I have a, a client who actually bought this really high tech camera because he wanted it. And I was like, I don't think you need it. And it, it auto focuses. Um, it's very, very sensitive. So anytime he moves, it's focusing and focusing and focusing and it just doesn't look great. And I'm like, you know, I think you should go with the one that was 75 bucks and let's just see what that one looks like. Sometimes it's better. Uh well, we're about wrapping up, but uh, a lot of people are wondering about time management. This all sounds overwhelming. They maybe have a, a day job, so to speak, and, sure. and other obligations. And you've coached a lot of people. What, what would you say to people in that position uh, to get started with all this? You do have to go slow. So first, you're going to be in in the mode, uh, you know, of learning. And if you're not on TikTok and you're not on, on Instagram, like just start looking to see what do people do? You don't have to do, you know, the boil video like Nikki does. You don't have to do, you know, all, all those types of things. It can be you, it can be uniquely you. So you want to first do some research, see what's out there. And then I would say, you know, start practicing, start doing videos. When I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of times the first few videos we do never see the light of day. It's only for me and them to go through because otherwise, you know, it, it's, it's, it's too much pressure to say, oh, you're going to do a video in one take and you're going to put it up on Instagram. It's not going to happen. So to be realistic about that and be kind to yourself, that's a, that's a big thing here. I think we're all sort of beat ourselves up, especially as authors. It's like, you wrote a whole book and now you have to go promote it too. It's a lot of work. Uh, so I would say, you know, the first few things that you do, don't feel like you have to post them. Keep it for yourself. You'll do it over time. And then I love to batch videos. That is my best tip for being, you know, time time management here uh, is to have a list of ongoing ideas that you have. So we talked in the beginning about your niche and about your topics. Just pull a bunch of those. What are the questions people constantly ask you? What are the things that keep coming up? Those are great ideas for videos. That's a great way for you to sort of consistently share what you know. Make a list of all of those. And then let's say it's on a Friday, bang through a couple of videos, right? You're going to do three videos at a time. So then by Friday, you have three, uh, and then you can post one each, each week or once every day or whatever it is. I would say consistency really does matter. So I started blogging, oh my gosh, 10 years ago or who knows. And I would blog very, very consistently about lists. And this has been going on all of this time. This following does not happen overnight, right? You have to consistently do it. Um, but don't feel bad about trying something. And then if you don't like it, it's okay. You don't have to do it. You can find something else that will also help to amplify your message. What was the link for the consultations that you mentioned? We should pop that ah, in the chat. Sure. It's speakwithpaula.com. Great. 
And uh, just a note, so you can see these are very easy to say. Uh, I do that on purpose because if you're doing media and especially podcasts or whatever, they might ask you, oh, what's your link? What's People might not know how to spell your name. They might screw up your name. So, you know, you want to have the URL for your book title for sure. And then easy to say things like this. They can redirect to your website. But for media, it's really important to have URLs that you can say out loud very easily and people can hear it and remember it. All right. Well, I think we'll put a pin in it for today. Um, we'll be back with Paula at the end of February. And the Authors Guild is planning a variety of marketing-related webinars for the months ahead. Please feel free to email us at support at authorsguild.org if you have any suggestions or questions about things you'd like to see from us in the future. Uh, Paula, thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, and we'll email some resources to everyone within a, within a day or two. Fabulous. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Take care.